Hello. For uh, the third video lecture for Chapter 3, we're going to start talking about uh, the different layers at the cell surface, which can also be referred to as the cell envelope. All right, so here's our uh, diagram of a genetic bacterial cell, which hopefully you've been taking a look at that in your textbook. And you'll notice, if you look carefully here, there's a brown outer layer here. Now, your textbook is, is uh, classifying that as an extension off of the cell surface, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about that as part of the cell envelope because it is a, a layer that can be pretty thick and extensive on some types of bacteria. And then inward from there we kind of see this pinkish layer and that is called the outer membrane. And if you not all bacteria have that, some do and some don't. Then we move inward from there and you see this kind of reddish pink layer and that is the cell wall. So cell wall, these are bacterial cell walls, not things have cell walls. Animal cells like ours, for example, don't have cell walls. And uh, as we'll see, that cell wall layer can be very thick on some types of bacteria. It's thin on others. And then there are a few types. There is the cell membrane or the cytoplasmic membrane, or maybe you've learned it as the plasma membrane. That's the, uh, the lipid covering, phospholipid covering that you have around the, um, the whole cell itself. And so all bacteria, all living things have a, a, a cell membrane. All right, so let's talk about this outermost covering first. And again, your textbook is classifying this as an extension off of the cell surface or cell envelope. But we're going to talk about it as one of those four surface layers that make up the uh, envelope. So all of these surface layers together make up the envelope. So on our generic bacterium there in brown, this is representing something called a glycocalyx. Okay, and not all bacteria have this outermost layer. Um, it tends to be sticky, gelatinous in consistency. Typically, it's going to be built from polysaccharides. Glycocalyx, glycocalyces is plural. Those can differ on different types of bacteria. So on some bacteria, they're very well organized, and they evenly cover the entire surface might extend really far outward from the surface. And those types of glycocalyces are referred to as capsules. So you've got repeating units of organic molecules. Usually they're, they're polysaccharides. And we're going to remember that many pathogenic bacteria have capsules. And when they do have them, they help protect them from phagocytosis. So the white blood cells in your body that are out to get all these invading microorganisms, uh, some areas thinner than others. Kind of a key thing with the glycocalyx, whether it's, is it's going to protect cells from drying. Now you think about it, you sneeze out some bacterial cells out of your mouth and they land on a dry surface somewhere. Uh, you know, they might be sitting on that dry surface for a long period of time before they get picked up and, and wind up in a moist environment again. So the, for bacteria that have a glycocalyx, you, you think about, oh, these are typically built from polysaccharides. Think about if you left sugar out on your kitchen counter on hot humid day. What's going to happen to that sugar? It's going to pretty quickly absorb water from the atmosphere. Polysaccharides love water. They attract water from the air. Um, and so if a bacterial cell has a glycocalyx coating, water models from the air are going to attach to that and it's going to help keep the bacterial cell hydrated. It's going to protect it from drying out. So that's kind of an interesting protective feature of a glycocalyx. Let's see. There we go. I'm kind of having some technical difficulties over here with the iPad that I'm drawing on. There we go. All right. So let's talk, though, about uh, this is a really important topic in clinical microbiology. And please be sure you're reading this information in your textbook, biofilms. All right. So when I was taking microbiology for the first time back in the 1980s, we didn't talk about biofilms. This is a newer concept that's emerged during the, um, during the last couple of decades. Now, once you've heard the term, you're going to notice it being used. Microorganisms like bacteria, little single-celled organisms, appreciate that microorganisms often actually live together in communities and, and cooperate with each other. And past couple of decades, we've come to... So when microorganisms get together and live in a community, sometimes they secrete sticky substances, which we call a biofilm because it's made up of living things.
And so what they're showing you here from got some microorganisms that are going to form a, a biofilm. You have some first colonists. You remember a colony in microbiology refers to a group of microorganisms that are, are living. Well, in the laboratory, they're living on an auger type of medium, but we can refer to colonizing microorganisms out in the real world as well. So these microorganisms attach to a surface and they start producing these sticky substances and uh, that's going to help those microorganisms um, attach to each other. Then, And pretty soon you've got this mixed community that's producing all this sticky substance that's helping them adhere to a surface. So kind of characteristic of a biofilm, strongly adherent. So all those sticky substances, carbohydrate rich substances that they're producing are helping them attach to a surface. And it's protective for the microorganisms. Like we just said, those carbohydrates that are coating these might absorb water and keep them hydrated. But also, if you think about it, let's say you've got a biofilm that's developed in your body somewhere and you're on an antibiotic drug for a bacterial infection. Uh, if I'm an antibiotic drug over here, I can't penetrate that biofilm very well to get in there and kill those bacteria. So biofilms have major clinical significance from that standpoint. Also, biofilms can coat things like catheters that are inserted into patients to help them urinate or catheters that are inserted into patients to provide nutrition or for blood withdrawal, uh, um, breaking off of the biofilm and entering the body. And biofilms are difficult to clean off and keep flushed off of. So biofilms have major clinical significance and that's not the only semester for sure that we'll, uh, that we'll talk about those. All right, so let's move inward from the glycocalyx and now into this kind of hot pink layer called the cell wall. And again, uh, some living things, their cell thing is the cell membrane, um, but not all living things do. So animal cells do not. So human cells do not have a cell wall, but bacteria have cell walls. Um, algae have cell walls. Plants have cell walls. Fungi have cell walls, but they're composed of different substances. All right, so what do we have? So cell wall is inward from a glycocalyx. Not all bacteria have the glycocalyx, but almost all bacteria do have a cell wall. Um, one thing I want to point out to you about the cell wall is it is a rigid structure. It's not flexible. Um, it is providing protection from osmotic forces. And remember osmosis, if you've studied osmosis before, that's the movement of water across a cell membrane in biology. And, um, you know, based on the concentrations of solutes dissolved substances in the fluids that a cell is sitting in that influences whether a cell takes up water or whether a cell loses water and we'll review that in more detail later but um, bacteria often find themselves in situations where they take up a lot of water so water moves across the cell membrane and because of that bacterial cells often find themselves in situations where they're swelling so the cell wall is almost like a chain link fence, a rigid structure around the surface of the cell that helps protect that cell from, from bursting due to the uptake of, that, uh, uptake of that water. Some other features of bacterial cell walls, in some cases they help them attach to other cells. And when we study antibiotic drugs later in the semester, we're going to see that um, um, many of the antibiotics that you take, penicillin for example, or amoxicillin, ampicillin, things like that, they work by preventing bacteria from being able to build their cell walls. And if you can't build a cell wall, those bacteria are going to burst. They take up water and they, they detonate, they explode from due to those, uh, the pressure from all that osmosis. Okay, and so we're going to um, see now that bacterial cell walls are made from a special organic macromolecule, large molecule that's called peptido. And I've pulled in some uh, diagrams here from an older textbook that I like a little bit better than the ones in your textbook, but it tells us what peptidoglycan is composed of. So glycan hopefully is reminding you a little bit of glucose, so that's referring to sugars. And the glycan portion of peptidoglycan consists of chains of repeating sugars 
So those are pretty long organic chemistry names, and so we typically just call those NAG and NAM. But uh, what this diagram is showing you, there's the chemical structure of glucose. Whenever you guys see these organic chemistry, it's understood that there's a carbon atom there. They just don't draw them in to make the diagrams a little easier to understand. So that's what glucose looks like. And so NAG and NAM kind of look like glucose, but you can see that there are some other uh, patterns of other atoms that are attached there to, to make them unique and, and different from glucose. But um, So the glycan portion, again, you've got these repeating NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM chains. Peptido, hopefully that's re reminding you of peptide. And a peptide, when you hear that term, that's generally a short chain of amino acids. So whenever you're hearing peptide, polypeptide, protein, that's always referring to chains of amino acids. And what the peptides do, they form cross bridges between the sugar chains. Because we want our peptidoglycan cell wall, you got these nagnam sugar strips, and we need those held together in this dimension, and then also in this dimension. We need this to be a three-dimensional structure. And so that's what the, uh, the peptides, or those chains of amino acids, do. They are connecting chains of amino acids that link together the nag nagnam sugar strips. Got to be careful about how you're how you're saying that. And that gives this a, um, makes this a rigid fence-like structure around the surface of the cell. And it's porous, so things can move through here. So if I've got some water out here, it's going to toward the cell. Um, or if you have nutrients, well, so you got some sugars that that bacterial cell needs for food, they're going to be able to move through the cell wall as well. It is not a, it's not a brick-like structure. It's porous. Things can move through it. All right, here's another view of peptidoglycan, and this is from your textbook. And again, when you see the G's, move back. When you see the G's on the diagram from your textbook, those are the NAG sugars, and the M's are the NAM sugars, and then they're drawn in those. Uh, peptide crosslinks for you. And over here on this part of the diagram, they're actually showing you the names of the amino acids that are used in those peptide crosslinkers. So L-alanine, D-glutamate, L-lysine, D-alanine. Those are all glycine over here. Those are all actual names of amino acids. And remember, a peptide is a chain of amino acids. So look on the, um, the ingredient list for a, um, a protein shake type drink that provides a supplement type drink that provides you with amino acids after you work out. Um, and you'll see the names of some of those amino acids on there. All right, so that concludes our uh, first little video clip on things going on here with the cell envelope. Please read thoroughly through the material in your textbook. And keep in mind, again, peptidoglycan, it's porous, it's kind of like a chain link fence, and it is going to protect bacterial cells from bursting when they take up water.